China. Cradle of civilization in Asia. Homeland of 450 million human beings. More than one-fifth of the population of the Earth. Like our own America, China is a vast and beautiful country with wide extremes of climate and contour. Scenes like these have inspired its poets and painters from time immemorial. China once seemed almost as remote as the moon to us here in America, but the airplane has brought it within 50 flying hours of our coasts, and our common struggle has brought its people close to our hearts. Today, our soldiers and theirs fight together on many battlefields. Our flyers and theirs guard the skies of China side by side. So we want to know more about these people of China, our friends and our allies, how they live and work, and about their country, which many of us will visit in the days to come. China is a land of rivers, great and small. And an important staple of food is fish. In this type of fishing, you don't have to bait a hook or worry about whether the fish will bite. The cormorant takes care of all that. These birds are slaves of a notorious appetite, a fact which Chinese fisherman wisely turns to his own advantage. The cormorant seems to be happy in his slavery. Everyone seems contented with the whole arrangement, except, understandably, the fish. The staff of life in China is not bread, but rice. Rice fields, called paddies, dot the landscape. But even so, the country cannot raise enough rice for its huge population. In peacetime, it had to import rice from other countries. Rice grows underwater. And here, the water is brought to the rice by a simple but effective mechanism, the water wheel. Agricultural methods like these are almost as old as China itself. The water buffalo is a popular beast of all work. Here he turns an irrigation wheel. More than 80% of all the people in China live on farms and the average individual farmer's holding is less than four acres. This means that every foot of fertile earth must be cultivated carefully and intensively from dawn to dusk of every day. There are hundreds of thousands of little farms handed down from generation to generation through the centuries and work today with the same tools and methods as of old. The Chinese raise vast crops of wheat, tea, beans, millet, and other cereals and grains. They've never been prosperous enough to support cattle and sheep on the yield of their tiny farms. And comparatively little land is given over to pasture. Land is simply too valuable and must be devoted to subsistence crops. Experts from our own Department of Agriculture are now working with the Chinese government on a program of scientific farming, studying such problems as soil conservation, erosion, and reforestation. After this war, an agricultural modernization probably will accompany the industrialization of the country, for the machine and modern scientific methods have come to China to stay, and perhaps to put an end to want and famine, as well as to scenes like these. Where there are so many mouths to be fed, nearly everybody has a job to do. Yes, in China, everybody works. Well, nearly everybody. Here's a handsome and healthy looking family and a typical farm home in the north. Further north, beyond the Great Wall, there are different scenes. This is a country of wild mountains and wastelands, of nomadic tribes of herdsmen and horsemen, and it's the home of the famous Mongolian ponies, whose ancestors carried the legions of Genghis Khan on their conquest of the ancient world. A conquest that led to the very gates of Vienna, that overran Russia and ruled the earth from Korea to the Volga. 
the cowboys of our own Wild West could hardly show these riders any tricks of horsemanship. You'll notice that instead of a lariat, they use a long pole with a noose at the end. And they invariably get their horse. Another vital industry in China, salt. This arrangement of sails catches every wind that blows and thereby turns the pump that brings the salt up from the mine. Through the centuries, many wars have been fought for the possession of this essential of human and animal diet. That is held true in the present war, for the invaders rightly consider they have won a victory when they can deprive a section of China of its salt supply. Even ice and snow do not stop the important business of fishing. Here they are fishing through the ice of a stream, a job that requires all the patience and all the warm clothing you can possibly muster. And lest you suspect that they never catch a fish, here is proof that they do. This seems to be something that the youngsters in America never thought of spinning their tops on ice. Here's also something new for American boys and girls to try, a combination of skating and sledding. This seems to be a lot of fun, but of course you have to be built for it. In the interior, problems of transportation are solved in many different ways. For cross-country journeys through desert country, they use the camel as in ancient times. When the Burma Road was closed for a time in 1940, camel caravans from Russian Turkestan were China's principal supply line to the outside world. In transportation, there is always the mule, everywhere on earth and everywhere in China. The mule is unbeatable as a burden carrier where the going is rough and highways non-existent as in most of the interior. The government's initial 10-year program calls for something like 200,000 miles of modern roads in the period of reconstruction, plus nearly 20,000 miles of railroads and a network of airlines for passenger and freight. But meanwhile, there is the mule. And where burdens are not too great or distances too long, human muscles do the job, out here in the country and in the towns and cities as well. Transport by river and canal is a vast industry. The smaller boats are called sampans. Some of them are propelled by skull.